Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today, I'm here with Matt Rod, and he is a specialist in buying websites and flipping websites and the passive side, buying as passive as we, we can get inside of any business, the passive side of buying, owning, and, and running uh, web based businesses. Thank you for being on the show today, Matt. Thanks so much for having me on, Ron. It's awesome to be here. Well, we always like to start off with origin. You and I talked a little bit before the show. We we're having a good time. So to kind of catch everybody up, <laughs> you're one of the OGs in this flipping websites and stuff. You actually, because I did it years ago, back when we, you know, it was all on warrior forums and stuff like that. And you happen to know what those are. Yep. That's an instant in- indication that you've been doing this for a while because now they've got fancier websites to sell these things. Give us your origin story. How did you get into this space? What did you do beforehand? Let's get the audience to kind of know who you are before we get started. Yeah, I think, well, I, I think for, for me, ever since a ki- being a kid, I grew up in a very poor environment and I grew up on farms and things like that. And my, my dad was a, a farm manager. And I think two things that influenced me, one was I wanted to figure out how to get some money. And two was I always loved this idea of making money from thin air. So I was obsessed with like business and in particular, as I got a bit older, this idea of passive business. So making them as passive as possible. I I didn't want to be working nine to five or these days it's five to nine. And so the journey I went on was to figure out how to get the best business and have this ideal business model where I can work whatever, wherever we, wherever I want. And luckily for me, I met my wife, my beautiful wife, Liz, and she's been on that same journey and she grew up in the country as well, on farms as well. And why that's important is, one, Ron, one of the big things for us was we wanted businesses that allowed us to work from home or remotely, like in rural areas in rural Australia. And so for us, we started buying and selling businesses. We realized that was the way to true wealth. And like I said, that passive business idea, I think one of the things that influenced us a lot was in the early days, we were lucky enough to read, we we bought our first business 30 years ago. And I think in 1997, Robert Kiyosaki wrote his famous book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And we'd already owned a couple of businesses by then but we knew we were on the right path. And I think that book just reinforced in us. Do you remember Robert wrote in there, it's not just about being a rich dad, poor dad idea, but the businesses, remember he said you buy laundromats or um, car washes because you can put a jockey in and run them. And that's kind of the journey we went on. We hung out with high net worths who are also buying and selling businesses. And we loved it so much, we ended up working for them as like M&A specialists. We did business deals up to about 20 mil here in Australia. But then kids came along and also the internet around the same time. So this was around the GFC, around 2008, maybe a little bit beforehand. And we suddenly realized Liz, she's super smart. She's really good with business. Suddenly realized, hey, we can just buy and sell businesses, but now we can do it online. What, what the hell are we doing with bricks and mortar? We don't have to go to the banks to loan money anymore. We can buy you know, these cash flow businesses. And it was amazing. It was very, we just literally built up a portfolio of websites, just like our high net worth mentors were doing, but you know, they're raising tens of millions of dollars to do it. We just did it in our pajamas at home at night, building up these websites and build up these portfolio of cash flow websites and the beautiful thing for us was, Ron, we suddenly had access 
to America, which is the world's biggest marketplace. And so most of our websites were based in America and here we are in Australia. So there was no geographical borders anymore, like with our bricks and mortar businesses. We used to export to America with our bricks and mortar businesses, but to be able to do it from the internet, from a laptop, was just mind blowing to us. So we literally started making money 24 seven while we slept, basically on autopilot. And to us, we'd reached nirvana in terms of buying and selling businesses that that was we were hooked from day one so i always tease with all of my uh people from overseas when we go to school here in grade school and kindergarten here they start teaching us like immediately anytime there's a problem the first question we're supposed to ask is what can i buy to solve it and there's something yeah. about americans and i mean and we still i have to get to my wife and, and my family like this because every time a little thing pops up we're like cool, cool what do we need like, no, it's not yeah. what we need, it's what do we do. It's very often like when the problem pops yeah. up, it's what do you do to solve it? But the, our okay. natural instinct is what do I need? Like, I'll, I'll go buy a better calculator. It's a math problem. I guess I need a better yep. calculator. So, yeah, we're a consumer-driven country for sure. And, and it's the and it's the best country, like the, the best country to do this, like buying and selling websites because or to have website space because the because of that, because it's consumer driven, actually, quite a few people mention that, like when we speak to all our American friends, they, mm -hmm. they say it is really noticeable. And that's why affiliate marketing and, and semi passive websites, I need to say they're semi passive now, not quite as passive what they used to be. But they just work so well in America. And you guys have also got world's biggest economy, and definitely world's biggest online economy. So it's very mature. And also, you've got the population. So here in Australia, we've only got 30 million. You guys have got 10x that. You guys have got around 300 million people. Mm -hmm. And all the different time zones, big country, it, it's absolutely perfect. And we were buying and selling back then, Ron. These marketplaces for websites didn't exist. So it was wonderful for us. We got to meet so, make so many American friends because we would just privately email Americans who owned these websites that we we're interested in. And we say, hey, we're here in Australia, we're cash buyers. Do you want to sell your website? We noticed you haven't done much work on it recently. And that's pretty much how we got started. And we got chatting to so many different business people in America and we started buying websites off them. And it was brilliant. It was absolutely, and back then that was on Skype. These days it's all on Zoom, but back in those days it was all on Skype. So when you were getting into this in 97, I was just getting out of the military and going to work for Lockheed Martin and defense contractors and that type of stuff. Wow. All okay. my buddies started making big money in the dot-com space. And I thought, I'm going to have to check this out. So yep. within a few years, I jumped out of the defense contracting world and got into the dot-com world just as it started to explode, okay. like, like to implode, I yep. should say. So. Uh, yep. Unfortunately, the experience I had in the dot-com world, besides a few good startups, was mostly helping them liquidate equipment and like deal with the bust. Yeah, you know this marketplace well. You've seen, been through the booms and busts. Yeah. Well, now it's matured though. That's the good thing. It's a lot more mature. It's not the wild, wild west that it used to be. Yeah. And particularly in what the, the area we're in, like you, I noticed you've had a few guests on your show who are from our community, like Blake Hutchison from Flipper and Joe Burrell. He's mm. one of our original students that we personally coached. And he's done over 5 million in, in website deals now. But it, that's because it's a lot more mature. It's not that boom and bust like back, like you said, like in the late 90s. It was a pretty wild west place. But now it's a lot easier, a lot more accessible for people wanting to transition out of their corporate careers. So somebody's in a corporate career right now and they're thinking, mm -hmm. I want to live the remote lifestyle like I do. I live in a tiny home. This I was telling you before, this is a tiny cool. studio, right? We can pack That's up and awesome. leave. Anyone. There are redwood trees in my front yard, 350 foot tall nice. redwoods. Like we're, we could move anywhere. Wow. You know, we, this is the third time in five years we've moved. That's how you want your life to be. That's how you want to you know, be able to earn income doing that. That cool. is the dream. That's what we help people do. So what skill I'm pre previously a nerd, right? I, I told you a little yep. bit beforehand. When I worked for Lockheed Martin, it was very common me, for me to sit behind a network sniffer and watch traffic go by. But for the average guy coming out of business, what skill set should they have if they're going to own, operate, or who should they hire if they don't have the skill set? What is the criteria, the entry criteria to be in this space? That's a really good less, uh, question. In my opinion, the number one skill you need if you want to do this is just learn the basics of how a website works and learn how to build a basic WordPress site. And that's, of course, what we teach. But we, we do train. So anyone listening, we specialize, been doing this, got a lot of experience of helping people transition from corporate to doing 
being able to work online full time. And I think it always boils down to actually, Ron, there's two key skills is one is which your listeners will find really interesting. One is that on the surface, the boring learn how to build a basic WordPress site. But don't worry if you're listening, you don't have to be full on technical or anything like that at all. Because then Ron, as Ron very smartly mentioned, after that, you just outsource everything. It's dead easy. So that that that's skill number one. But actually, the next most important skill that kind of goes hand in hand with that is learning how to do website due diligence, which is very similar to when you buy and sell a bricks and mortar business. So I know like you cover on your podcast a lot talking about website, so business due diligence. Well, that's the key skill that we love teaching people because in the early days, of course, we made all the mistakes and, you know, there's a lot of, there's not, I wouldn't say there's a lot of, well, there is a lot of, I take it for granted. To me, it's really easy doing website due diligence, but they're probably the two main ones and they're money-making skills for the future. In my opinion, they're, it is brilliant. And now the good news is we can teach complete beginners how to do that, yep. but it takes time. But once you've got those two skills under your belt, then like me as a kid, my dream was always you know, how do you make money out of thin air? I reckon then you can make money out of thin air. If you know what you're doing, if you know how to do a good website due diligence, you can pick yourself up a bargain. And then if you know how to what goes on in terms of the how the site's built, you can easily get an outsourced team to help you run that site. World's your oyster then. Then you can go and live in wherever you want and earn money from wherever you want. Yeah, I've built, I've built my fair share of WordPress sites. I've actually installed it I'm down to the core. I understand my SQL well enough. I can crawl through the databases from the command line and stuff. I'm a little Ooh, different. Wow, okay, so you, you are full I'm, on technical. Yeah, I'm a little different you know, than most. It's been a while since I've done one, but I, it's just like anything else, I can jump right back into it. The one thing I, I already knew about, and it's getting better because now like I get an automatic, WordPress itself gives me an automatic update every once in a while. Like, you need to install this. There's tools on there. But yep. one of my biggest issues with WordPress is it's so big that it's also a big target. So vulnerabilities pop up. I've had a, more than one of my WordPress websites hacked and you know replaced yep. with junk and had to rebuild them or whatever. So... Do they need to know what part of web security and that type of stuff that they need to know to secure yeah. their income? Yeah, that, that is definitely a bigger issue these days. But it's an issue for all business. If you want to be in business, you've got to learn how to cope with hackers anyway. Mm -hmm. And there's two really, for most sites, you've got to remember the sites that we're building or buying, so we build websites from scratch as well, are what's called niche sites. They're not massive targets. Like every site on the planet's a target to these. They're just bots, the, these mm -hmm. hackers. And really, they're pretty unsophisticated unless they deliberately decide to target you because you're like a particularly big site. But the good news is, first and foremost, we're building or buying what's called niche websites, like little tiny sites, like how to train your, your German Shepherd, how to, what are the best rifle scopes? What are the, what are the best you know, bug out bags or like you go into these niches or how to play golf better. And so that's a good thing that they're, they're not really worth hacking as such. But these days, there are some really good plugins that you can put on, which are free for, for WordPress. So like WordFence Security, it's one that we recommend all our clients use, it's totally free. It stops 95% of hacking attempts straight away because it, it's just a, it's a hard firewall around the site, website. And you don't, I'm not technical. It, my wife is pretty good technically, but we have techies that do all that stuff. I don't touch any of that, nor do any of our beginner clients. And then the other thing though, Ron, that's changed over the years, is website hosting now is heaps better. And they do a lot of the heavy work on or should do a good, ho there's, there's good and bad website hosts out there, but a lot of the hosting services, which by the way, are really cheap, like you're talking 10 bucks a month or $7 a month, and you can host unlimited websites. They tend to have a lot of firewalls now that they have to legally, and they will help you fix up websites if they get hit with malware, again, with the good hosts. So it's a lot easier than what it was you know, even 10 years ago, that side of the marketplace is getting better. And honestly, it's not, occasionally we see, we have a big community of students all, all around the world, like not just here in Australia, obviously in the US. And it's not something we see a lot of where they, you do see it every so often where a student site will get hacked, but it's a lot rarer now than it was 
say five or six years ago. So that's not a concern. The technical side, we, we, we talk about buying and selling websites all the time. And the number one thing people freak out about is like technical stuff, like what you're asking me, like security and how do you do all this technical stuff? That's not the main part around this right that skill we can teach you that's pretty easy you can learn that part-time in the evening because it's just click and drag these days wordpress basically works off click and drag like everything does that's not the skill the skill is exactly what you help people with on your podcast which is understand this due diligence ferreting out the deals getting off your butt and doing something like actually finding the good deals that are out there because there's some amazing website deals and that's the fun part and you don't, and it's understanding your risk too, because you're buying and selling businesses. So that's pretty much the main skill set that you need. If you're listening to this, you need to put aside the technical side. That technical stuff can either be learned or outsourced. That's easy. It's the mindset around being an entrepreneur and getting into this and buying and selling. And what are your goals? Do you just want one website? Do you want a portfolio? Do you want to replace your income? Are you looking at a side hustle? So it's about constructing your life, finding the time to study it and learn how all that works and then building up your portfolio, just like you would with bricks and mortar businesses, except you, you can probably go in and buy. It's a lot easier with websites because you can buy much smaller websites that are very profitable and you can get some amazing results. Whereas we've always found with bricks and mortar businesses, particularly as a young entrepreneurs, it's very difficult with the banks here in Australia. We're always trying to fund the businesses because we had heavy inventory like stock based businesses whereas with websites you can buy a really good website for under 50 grand or even under ten thousand dollars some of our best students have bought amazing sites one here's the sort of site you want to buy right right so one of our students they've bought a gardening website for four hundred dollars the guy had neglected it they'd noticed he hadn't touched it or updated it in years sent him an email said sure i'll sell it for 400 bucks it's spring here, right? It's just turning into summer here, sorry, now in, in Australia. And they will, they're will they already making $4,000 a month off that website. So that's semi-passive income. They, they, they have two riders on it. They don't touch it themselves. They're not gardeners. They're laptop lifestyles. They live in Thailand at the moment, living on a, off a laptop. <laughs> and so for 400 bucks, these young guys, that's they're traveling the world. They own about 10 websites. And their websites range from making like five hundred dollars a month up to four or five grand a month, and ten of those, there's a six figure income, easy. So, what's the timeline from the time you buy something? Because I know that content takes a while. There's SEO. It does yeah. So I'll tell you what I'm looking yeah. for and why, just because it'll. It, okay. I'm looking because yep. I own Paixu Media Holdings, and that's my company that holds this podcast. It owns Perfect. a couple of newsletters. And we're looking to acquire other content, mostly in the B2B space, because it's what I know. And yep, I think we can, good. yeah, I think it's a, a little bit more, uh, you call it economy agnostic. B2B is going to work fairly decent and a down economy yep. is still going to work. So we're kind of looking in that space. That said, I'm more interested in WordPress driven websites with great content that got good, okay. uh, maybe not, I don't care if they're monetized at the p- potential in the beginning, as long as they have good content, good traffic. And they're starting to already collect their emails, right? Yep. I want them to own a list of some sort because I'm more interested in alleviating some of the pain of the Google algorithm changes by totally. building a really strong newsletter behind the you know behind the content and owning like the customer list basically. Yep, and that that's really really smart. We teach exactly that. Like get you. you whilst we love Google, you definitely all things being equal, if you can have an alternative list with a website off to the side, like a list or a really strong social media following, which is in essence, like a private Facebook page. When you think about it, that's pretty much a list or a really good YouTube channel or the new thing, which is we're seeing, which is working really well is newsletters because they're in, that's a highly engaged audience. So they go hand in hand. And so what you're trying to do is literally what, that's a key money-making strategy that we love to teach, which is build up this portfolio. You can't, you kind of like become your own little media channel and you can identify your niche. And you touched on something there, Ron, which is really smart. You don't even have to worry, especially once you know what you're doing, but even as a beginner, you don't really even have to worry about monetization because that comes, I have a saying in our community, people know, (laughs) you get me a website with a million eyeballs, I'm going to make a million bucks off it. 
that that's basically if I get a million visitors a month, that's a seriously kick, uh, well, let's just say kick butt website. That's a pretty and that's so, a pretty hefty website, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's about the traffic. So you mentioned mm-hmm. as long as it's got traffic, and these days I can tell you, traffic is literally money in the bank. If you're listening to this, it's like an asset. These websites are changed. They're not just pretty online brochures or places where you look at you know, cat videos. Like what Ron's saying, any business site or any website, like we buy hobby sites like gardening and golfing and pet training. Any site that has lots of traffic though, I don't care what the niche is, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. If that traffic is engaged, is like money in the bank. It, it is literally going forward. That will become, it's like the new virtual real estate. And it is incredibly, and then like Ron's saying, it's a really smart idea. If you can layer onto that a bit of a list of some kind, you are building up for the long term. This is not a get rich quick thing. I'll come back to your question. But for the long term, that is literally like building up a portfolio of bricks and mortar businesses, or I guess, you know, like real estate. We view it as pretty much online real estate. Okay. The main reason I'm concerned about not having the list would be the algorithm changes constantly with Google. Right? Yeah, it does. I, yeah, I know people who were doing really, really well, like really well, high six figures, low seven figures per year that are now like sent scrambling because the one of the algorithm change thing cut their income yep. by down like by 70, 80 percent. Right. And that 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 is a business risk. And but the good thing is you can learn from that. We've seen that across our community a lot over the years. But you, one big way that you can potentially mitigate that is something that I keep mentioning and that we're passionate about because that was our strategy. We only teach what we do, right? So we right. don't touch e-commerce sites for a start. Right. Anyone exactly. listening, yeah. just for the record, we're not interested in e-commerce because of our background in manufacturing and wholesale businesses. We don't ever want to touch an online business that involves physical inventory because you tie up all your capital and it holds you back. We want to be debt free and nimble. But <clears throat> the way we mitigate risk for us and what we recommend is a portfolio of sites, ideally five to 10 websites. So if one takes a hit, the others uh, are still generating you an income. And that's what we've, we've all actually, by the way, that's how we did it with bricks and mortar business as well. We bought, but it's a lot harder with that. I don't recommend that if you're listening to this and you're a beginner, that would not, it's a very challenging thing to do with bricks and mortar businesses these days. But with websites, you can build up this really nice portfolio of what starts out with little tiny sites and you build them up over time. And they're kind of semi-passive. You're not working on them full time so you can do it while you're transitioning from a job or whatever. Just do it in the evenings. And that's what a lot of our students do. But mitigating that risk is important and that's why we love the portfolio idea, owning multiple websites. So uh, let's talk a little bit about like some of the other interesting things we can do inside of the space and maybe even some of the risk. So uh, I'll give you I'll give you a good case study. I was looking at a re- fairly recently, a few months ago, I looked at buying a website with a decent list, 25,000 subscribers on the list. Website nice. was doing about 90 to 110,000 page views per month. And it was a very specific Ooh. high-end clientele, meaning uh, private equity, family offices, really high-end type of content. One of the things I noticed in my pre-due diligence, because interesting was I found it through through this podcast and through other stuff, the guy I was chatting with, and I don't think he thought I was serious about buying it until he gave yep. me a number in the low six figures. And I said, okay, let's do this deal. And he's like, you're serious? Now I got to figure out if I have to, if it's a, a benefit to my business or a distraction from it, right? Now that I know you're serious, I got to think about this. And I said, okay, while you do that, I'll do a little pre-due diligence. I'm going to crawl through your website a little bit, see what you got. And I did some, but I didn't like, technically, I didn't get into it. One of the first things I noticed was it was uh, on a proprietary content management system. And I was like, Ooh. okay, you know, like a, a custom built tool. And I reached yeah. out to him and said, yeah, I, I don't touch That's, those. Yep. He goes, well, the company that we're using is going to move it to WordPress. I said, okay, they have to be really, really good at what they're doing to do they that, do. or you're going to lose all your traffic. And he was like, yep. no, no, they've done it a bunch of times. We're not going to lose any traffic. I was like, Mm. I doubt that. It's like you have, there's a, it's so complex. Every URL that any, you know, they had 3,700 links. And I said, every link mm. that's going to your website and some of them really good links. Um, every link that goes to your website has to be remapped to the new content. So there's some technical nerdy ways to do it through .ht access files. And they'll just kind of crazy 
redirect and do all like you got to sit there and hand map everything or yeah. you got to build out wordpress and do a custom structure inside of there to where every url that used to work still works and i said i, I don't think your people doing this i don't think they're going to get it right and he said well no no they got it i said i'll tell you what i'll revisit this after the move yep, right. that's the way to do it let them do it so yeah it's full-on technical stuff like that and particularly for our audience who are not technical like myself we, we just say that's a massive red flag walk away find another deal so someone like you you ron you sound like you could actually handle it pretty okay and at least you understand what's going on and the good news is there's so many deals out there if you're listening is if you're a beginner you don't have to worry about that technical stuff you just move on to the next deal you're looking for really simple sites you do not want those hand-coded sites it is the they're always a bargain price too ron that's the problem because no one wants to fix them up this unless you've got a technical team this one was only generating high five figures almost six figures in revenue and yep. he was selling for very low two figure or six figures in ink for price. So about three X is what he's kind of yeah, wanting. Three X is normal at, yeah. at the moment in the market. Yeah, uh, and most of his income was from that twenty five thousand mailing list. He had a few people that would host oh, events yeah. two or three times a year and they would pay him big money to mail out to his mailing list that they were hosting an event. I can look at their traffic, the traffic. and it and it goes straight from like uh, you know eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand. Now it's down below thirty thousand. Has been that way ever since the migration. So that's so. good. See, doing pre due diligence and knowing what you're looking for mm -hmm. saves you from a mistake, and that's what that's what we're about. You can always find good websites out there to buy. They're pretty easy. There's heaps of broker flat platforms like Flipper, Empire Flipper, for International, all the all those guys, Quiet Light, but. You still need to do the due diligence, even though the deals are a lot more vetted these days. And doing like what you've just said, it, it's pretty easy when you know how, though. And I want to reiterate, for someone non-technical, this stuff's pretty easy to learn What if you spend the time at it. And that, that you know, <laughs> I can give a plug, but that's what we teach people. Non-technical, because that's our background. We weren't technical. And it actually, it held us back a lot in the early days. It was a real struggle for us technically to get into this and to understand what are these redirects on things and how do you do the, how do you move a, a picture to over to the like right hand side or resize it, all those little things. But that's fun. Once you figure it out, these days it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of problem solving. So mentally it, it's good for you. It's fun doing that sort of stuff. And then you feel, and we find a lot of our clients because they tend to be 40, 50 plus or 60 plus with kids and stuff. They love it because then they can go to their kids and say, Hey, I just built a website or I renovated a website. And the kids are like, what? Cause the kids grow up being kids are fine with this stuff. Kid, kids take to it really easily, the technical side. So that's a pretty cool outcome when you, when you learn how to do all the technical side. So, Let's talk about what are the qualifications, what are you looking for? Now, you said, you mentioned something earlier. I told you I'm mostly interested in B2B. I also like yep. pas passion niches. So passion if, niches. So if somebody's truly huge. passionate. So pets, yep. in the pets. sporting goods world, maybe golf, bass fishing, right? Oh, in, any sport. Like you can get, yeah, fishing and then you can go, so we've owned fishing sites and then you yep. go, you niche down into like bass fishing. So any hobby, we call it passion niche, any hobby or sport that yep. people are into and particularly ones is a big hint anywhere there are beginners learning how to do stuff because yep. actually how we make money online when you think about it and think about when the internet first started well first started to become popular when the browsers started working properly when people go online if they're not looking for funny cat videos what are they looking for they're looking for solutions right so what we say to people is think about this when you're doing due diligence or what niches you want to get into all you're doing is answering questions. We're actually there to help people. Now, you don't have to be an expert in, like Nathan and Alexi, you know, they're not experts in, in gardening. They, they live in a lap, off a laptop. They're, they're traveling around the world because you, you hire experts off places like Upwork. But the niches that you go into and essentially what we're doing with these when we're talking semi-passive websites is we're answering questions. So if someone wants to know how to be richer or healthier or happier, and happiness, we put, we love those passion sites. So if they, we've got a client now, he makes six figures off a, a guitar website. He teaches people how to play jazz guitar, actually. So Greg, he does, does that. And actually, we've got a really good example in the pet niche, which I have to share with you. So one of our clients, American client, Dave and Connor, they're on our podcast. He's made his money in America in commercial real estate. And then 
you joined our course and, and bought this website in America off a broker that was making $300,000 a year net, his net profit. He bought it for a million dollars and he did like seller finance plus got um, raised some money off some friends and stuff. Anyway, really good outcome because it's in pets. Now, he's not an expert in pets at all, but it came across with all the writers on there. There's about, I think there's like half a dozen writers. This is a big website, lots mm-hmm. and lots of traffic. And all they do is they make money off ads. So, so it's all automated and also off affiliate offers. So people will want to buy pet related products and they just get an affiliate commission they don't have to stock the physical inventory anyway within uh, owning it so he's fixing it up and i'm doing coaching calls with him and all he did you want to know what he did to double the profit just change the ad network that was they went literally. from amazon i mean amazon uh, google uh, no it went google from ad, like google yeah, ads google to- ads to it, they put Ezoic. what's called Media Vine on it. No, Media, it, Vine. It, it, Media Vine. And within two weeks, the profit had doubled. Now that thing makes six hundred thousand dollars a month, a year. Sorry, mm-hmm. six hundred thousand a year. So it's doubled, and that means the valuation on it is probably up around two and a half mil because it's in a really, it's one of the most popular niches at the moment, pets. And so. so that's a good ROI without yeah. having to do too. Now they've done, they're doing lots of other stuff on the site, but essentially that was the number one change. And that's the sort of thing we teach people. And you got, once you understand this, you can see these opportunities out there because that's one of the reasons actually go Dave, a smart guy. He actually picked up the original owner, set this site up as a passion site, was really passionate about pets and he just run it for 14 years and he never really worried about monetizing it because let's not kid ourselves if you're listening to this, 300 grand a year for a website that you love and are passionate about, that's serious coin. Now, that's a lot of money. So he didn't worry about trying to optimize the monetization. Whereas Dave in his pre-due diligence could see, oh, he's just running standard Google ad blocks on there. I can just stick it onto, by the way, Mediavine, if you don't know what it is, they manage the ads for you. So it's even more passive. It's not more work. It's actually less. And they take a cut, but at the end of the day, they optimize the ads for you, literally while you sleep. And yeah, doubled it from 300,000 to 600,000 a year. There's a uh, Google AdSense, which is what I hear the lowest paying one. And yep. then there's Mediavine and Ezoic. Who's the Ezoic. highest paying currently? Or does it depend on Medi- the niche? Med- Mediavine, definitely. Ezoic is is very variable, the results, what we see. So so one of the key strategies we teach people is exactly what I've just said. If you're listening to this, is when you buy a website, you want to p- test or I, I call it play with the monetization. And you want to test different monetization networks. And we recommend either Ezoic, Raptive, or Mediavine, but you need traffic. To get into Mediavine, you need to have 50,000 visitors a month. So that's when you're buying bigger websites. But I think unanimously across our community, we've all, so we've got a big database of very successful clients. And we see Mediavine consistently being the best one. And for our own portfolio, we found Mediavine the best. And Ezoic, the results are quite variable. So what you do is, if you're listening here, it typically passion site owners is why it's worth buying passion sites. Like in the case of that pet site, they don't really, they just stick the basic Google ads on there and they're not optimized, and but they don't care because they're making good money off them and they're kind of semi-passive. So what we do is we put what's called ad managers or ad networks onto the site. You just, it's free. You just you, you sign up with them and they have a chat to you. They look over your website and they make suggestions and then they manage the ads for you. It's kind of like an ad broker in a way, but it's all automated. And they can really, they can literally double the income of websites. We've done it heaps. It, it, you just literally double the income within a couple of weeks. So I would be interested, in addition to B&B, I would be interested in like one or two of those passion niches and that's pets. Because yep. I just think no matter what economy – what when COVID hit, what did we do in America? We went out, all, all of us went out and bought more pets. More pets were bought during COVID than any other time in history. So we just went and got more pets. I'll tell you another good niche, Ron, that, that you'll love is um, survivalist niche. It's huge in America, yeah. as you can appreciate. And that's just, that was even from when we started a decade ago and homesteading and stuff like that. But this survivalist niche now is, and of course, during COVID, that went. It really, but it was already accelerating. It's already a huge niche. These niches are what we call evergreen. They've been around. People say, oh, 
pets is huge now. It's always been huge. Crafting niche. Yeah. People say since COVID, it's gone nuts. No, it hasn't. It's always been big. Food blogs, massive now. Travel blogs. People love travel blogs because you get paid and it's tax free. Like you, you get paid to travel around whatever country it is that you want to travel around. Travel blogs are massively valuable now and they're legitimate it's because people blog about places that they travel to and they make full time incomes off this. We, we've got clients that are one of the, our, a recent interview I did with one of our clients, Annette, she bought a 14 year old you would call it RVing in America. Here in oh, yeah. Australia, we call it caravanning. And it was an Australian site. So this is in Australia where this where it's quite small compared to America, right? She bought that site for $5,000 off a private Facebook group, off a friend. No, no one else saw the value in it. And that site now makes $5,000 a month. Oh, by the way, she's retired with a husband and traveling around Australia in a caravan, and that's her main source of income. She just um, makes makes money off that little site. And those sorts of niches are hugely valuable now. That site would be worth, what's five times 30, whatever that is. It's in the six figures. It'd be worth over around 150K if she wanted to sell that now. And she bought it for five grand. This was about, I think it was two or three years ago. And she just built that up. So, so the, buy and hold or flip? Buy and hold, I reckon. I mean, where, this lends itself to website flipping. And I know that's probably, if you're new to this and you're going to Google this space, you're going to see lots of stuff about website flipping, which is even flipping those still takes about 12 months or so to get these sites going. So please don't think when I say you can you know, double the profits in two weeks, that that's just one part of it. You, you To flip, you still need a good 12 months, I reckon. It's not, I mean, some people do a lot quicker flips, but for us personally, because these are such valuable online real estate, I think you'd be crazy to sell off good good sites too early. Once you've got a good cash cow, although what happens is, Ron, when you own a portfolio of sites, right, once you start getting over 10 websites, no matter who you are, it's a fair bit of work, like headspace kind of running them. It sounds strange, even though they're kind of semi-passive, that there's a headspace. And what you do is you cycle out your smaller ones. So, but in general, what we're trying to do is get to this point of long-term assets like Warren Buffett teaches. So we're compounding our wealth and we run with our bigger winners. And that's typically, so for Liz and I personally, we're trying to, we, we hold them for like for multi years. They're, they're cash cow assets. They're, they're, they're like online real estate. We don't want to sell them off. Because the ROI just goes up and up and up. Even if they just sit steady, the, the long-term benefits. So we've been doing this now for 15 years and we have websites that we've held for more than a decade and far out are they have they generated a lot of money over that time. When you add it all up, it's mind-blowing. Even if it's small amounts, even if it's just making a 1000 bucks a month, it's better than money in the bank. You, you earn, what, 4% a year in the <laughs> bank. These things are earning... 30% ROI every single year for a decade, that's a lot of money. So inside of the brick and mortar world and, and even on SaaS and stuff, there's a, an arbitrage game that can be played. So you can buy uh, the arbitrage and, and what I'm referring to the arbitrage is basically the more company makes, the more the multiple goes up. So yep. in the brick like and that, mortar. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's now two and a half million dollars, that thing, and it cost them a million bucks. It goes up yeah. exponentially. So where I was going at, so for instance, I buy an automotive shop down the, the road here and it's doing 1 million. I'm going to I'm going to pay in, but 1 million or below in EBITDA. That'd be a hell of an automotive shop. But just for example, yep. I'm going to pay two and a half, three X, maybe 3.5 X for that in the current market. Um, if I can get five or six of those together and I get above that, there's a threshold here. If I can get above $4 million in EBITDA. I can sell it to a PE firm for five, six, seven X, right? And is there is there a awesome. game that can be played inside of this web Hell flipping yeah. to where if you get a yep. per, if you get above a certain place, can you sell it to the bigger boys for a higher multiple than the ten? Ab Absolutely, Ron. You are one smart man because that is the new trend that that's happening out there. We're seeing that, and I love that space because that was our space back in M and A. Mm -hmm exactly like that what you said with bricks and mortar with ebits of one mil that was our specialty of helping these and selling these those businesses we used to specialize in selling 
bricks and mortar businesses with EBITs of one to two mil here in Australia. And that's exactly what they were doing. They bolt them together. And now, and when you see that happening, when the big money like private equity is coming into that and high net worth families or family offices doing that, you're on like, that's a, that's a really good marketplace to be in and guess what's happening right now when we know all the big website brokers are doing exactly what you just said, all the big buyers, because they now recognize these things are are such valuable assets, particularly long-term and you need, they want a portfolio of them. They buy up, uh, they want EBITs of one to two mil. That's the sweet spot or, or bigger. Nice problem to have in life, isn't it? They can't go smaller than that. And then they bolt them all together and then that, makes the valuation go really high and they either go to an IPO or they typically are held privately now. And all the brokers are telling us it, what the arbitrage is. If you're a small player, you can buy small sites under 50,000 and build them up into much bigger sites. And then they get on the radar of these big buyers. And that's basically, I think it's a really popular strategy within our community. Like that's what Dave and Connor were doing with their pet site. So they're it, it's now got an EBIT of, of 600,000, right? Now it's on the radar of the bigger buyers who want to conglomerate in that pet niche. The other cool thing, Ron, is that this strategy that you're talking about, these big private equity firms now recognise niche is the way to go. They don't just need big finance sites or whatever like they used to in the past. They will literally buy up pet websites or survivalist sites if they've got this combined EBIT of a mil. And they are going into niches, like crafting niche is huge. The pet niche is huge. Certain, like gardening is starting to become big. Food blogs now are huge with the big buyers. And so if you're listening to this, exactly what Ron said, and you love, and you've got like the big goal of doing M&A and getting into that like seven and eight figure range, you do exactly what Ron said, is you, you bolt together these websites and you sell them out to PEs. And they can be cash deals too which is really interesting. Interesting. So I was just curious if that, I didn't even know that for sure that that arbor, my, the, what I buy these in is a hold co, right? I plan on yep. holding them. So I didn't, I was trying, I never did the research and go, do I have an arbitrage game to play later? Oh, right? no, you, it, it's yep. a really smart strategy if you can, if you think about it. And the good thing is, Ron, you don't have to be thinking this is what we love. So we come from that background, right? But I'm not interested in spending millions on websites. Don't have to. 50,000, honestly, with the way the economy is right now, and some people are saying it's a bit shaky or we could be interest, heading in interesting times, I think the safest and smartest spot to do this strategy that you're talking about, believe it, because you can with websites, we've done it multiple times, buy websites under 50K or under 100 grand. And you, know, you think bricks and mortar business, a decent bricks and mortar business, like you said, with a, you're looking in the seven figures, with websites, you can pick up bargain sites under 50,000 and double them or triple them and if you've got a group of them bolted together that's starting to get exponential the the exit price if you want to sell it to a much bigger player down the track so that's a really smart way to do it it's not giving financial advice here i'm just sharing what we do but you know it's a relatively low risk way compared to bricks and mortar world You, you think about it websites under 50 grand you can pick up some bargains for that and they call it asymmetric risk, which is there's hardly any downside because it's only, you know, you might only be risking 10 grand or whatever, but the upside is asymmetric. Like it's just through the roof. It's, you can take it into six and seven figures. So next question would be brokerage websites like Quiet Light, Flippa and those or cold yep. outreach? Oh, I'm still a fan of, I'm a fan of both. The beauty of the the brokers is that you do get really, really good deal flow and they're good operators. And these days, the prices have come back like to reality. The, the websites, are, if you listen to this, like, like Ron mentioned with bricks and mortar, websites are sold exactly the same, basically on a, on a 3x multiple, which is three times the net profit, net or three times the EBIT. Or basically, if you don't know what EBIT is, earnings before interest and tax, it's just the profit. So if the site makes, like our client site, makes 300 grand a year, it's worth three times that. And then it gets bigger, the bigger the site gets. And so the beauty of brokers is they pre-vet the deals now. So there's a, I'm not, again, not giving financial advice, but there is a relatively 
much higher degree of safety. And also they tend to know the sellers like they, they do a lot of pre-due diligence because they don't want to be selling scams and stuff like that. And so you do get really, really good listings and you get access to extremely good listings through brokers. But also... I would, when you get good at this, or if you love it, I still can't help myself. I like doing private outreach. That's how we made all our money years ago. We always, we did, by the way, we did the same with bricks and mortar businesses. That's how we always got the best deals was we would send letters, physical, remember those things, letters? Yeah. We'd send them as private. And, and I'm a direct mail nerd. Yep. Yeah, we put private and confidential and we'd send them out to factories in those in those grimy industrial areas. That was our specialty. We'd drive around industrial areas, look at businesses and, and privately contact them. And to this day, we do that, but we don't have to drive around in a car in industrial areas and we do it in our pyjamas at home, looking at websites online. We just go to their contact page. We'll send them an email and say, hey, noticed you haven't. You're looking for the sites that have been neglected and to say, hey, just wondering what you're doing on your site. We're in the same niche with you know, we're a cash buyer. You've ever, have you ever thought of selling? Simple as that. And so answer to your question, I think both strategies are really good. For the majority of people, though, the brokers are the best place to start out with if you're learning this, though, because you've just got so many access. So to if, you're not, if you're just starting out and you find a website you want, do you guys do the due diligence for people? or the, like, No, no, okay. not, we, we don't get involved in that. We teach people how to do it. Yeah. And also, we want to empower people. We want to pe- We don't get involved in that at all because legally, if we miss something, and it might be something good, by the way, you know, it'll take me two to three hours to do full due diligence on a website. And there's services out there that can do that, I believe. But you, you're better off learning how to do it yourself. You should, you're in control of your own money. Yeah, the biggest mistake we made in buying and selling businesses, particularly on our first one, was relying on the the advice on due diligence off an accountant, and he got it completely wrong. So we're all about te- empowering people to teach them how to do due diligence themselves. I think it's such a worthwhile skill. You'd be silly not to learn how to do it yourself. Okay. So I, I have somebody that I use for that. Even though I can do it myself, I like to have a third party look at it. Yeah, right. it's, that, that's okay, yeah. but you still need to know how to yep. get what you never yep. rely on. The one thing I've learned in business, because I hang around a lot of people that buy and sell businesses, both online and offline, and I can tell you every single one of them knows how to do good due diligence. Okay, you have advisors and you get a second opinion, that's fine. But at the end of the day, it's your money. If, you, if yeah. you're spending that money, you want to know what you're getting into. It's not the sort of thing I would recommend you delegate. And also because in your due diligence process, what you're looking for is opportunities to renovate that website. So think of like Dave and Connor who bought that pet site. I don't think a due diligence service would have picked up. Oh, no, they probably would have picked it up maybe, but there were some other renovation opportunities that he picked up just by having a really good look through the website. Because that's a big part of due diligence is understanding what are you going to do to renovate the website. And you want to have a clear idea in your head that, that you're up for it, particularly if you're buying bigger websites that there might be more work to do or if you bought a bargain site that's been neglected there's going to be a bit of work to, to tidy it up and so it's good to understand what you're getting into yeah i get that the one i was thinking i'm not going to say who it is because just because i'm not going to do that but the one i was thinking of it's one fee like i want to say it's less than two grand to have them do that oh, yeah. due diligence and then for another yep. 500 bucks they'll give you a, a detailed report on all the low-hanging fruit switching oh, that's from, pretty cool that, yeah so that 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 can be good, but what I worry about is when. So you're quite advanced. Yeah. You you, you already you know. Been. Yeah, you know a lot, and so it, that those reports will make infinite, like will make a lot of sense to you, and you'll get it. What I worry about is if someone's listening to this and they're a total beginner, yeah. and they rely on that report, they're kind of being, they're going. You have. Blind I get it. Yeah. You need that foundational knowledge. Maybe that's the way to. Yeah, that's my concern because I think back to Liz and I, the mistake we made all those years ago. We were just total beginners in business and we relied on this due diligence that this accountant did on the business. And when we got into it, it was almost going bankrupt. And that that really, that was a very challenging time. Like we nearly went bankrupt multiple times because of that. And it took us years to, to catch up on that. That was a bricks and mortar business. But I think if we'd been, if we had some more basic knowledge, then we would have understood more what the accountant had shown us. And it just when you're totally new, Relying on a third party for due diligence is not the best way. It's more that's more useful when you're quite experienced. And I'll go as far as say a lot of people ask me how much information or how much knowledge do I need before I get 
do X, Y, and Z. And I always refer, refer back, you really want a good BS meter, but you yep. really want to do enough of your own knowledge where you can, like, I know enough, I've been around this space enough that it's a basically a time versus money thing. I'd rather yep. pay 2,500 bucks for somebody to go through and rip through it. That's their expertise. All they do in that group of people is they do due diligence on content websites and they give yep. me a low hanging fruit thing. It's not because I'm lazy. It's because now they'll get it done in, you know, two to three hours or next day turnaround type of thing. And it saved yep. me two or three hours. That's worth more to me now than the yeah, 500 that, bucks to do it. And that's a good point. I can yeah. skim through it and go, what about? Because I have that BS meter, right? I can, that's right. you know. And Ron, you've got the experience too. You'll read that report and go, yep, yep, yep. You'll just understand it yep. instantly. And you, that's the advantage of people like yourself and myself. We're quite experienced. Yep. And so that that's when those services work really, really well. They're, they're kind of like an adjunct to your own due diligence and like you said if you don't have the time to get in and do it but i want to urge anyone listening understand the basics of good website due diligence gosh it's a it's a handy money making skill let's just put it that way for, for the future so here i do it probably a little bit backwards than most people would advise i get in i look at it myself and i like when i figure out i can't find anything else I will go ahead and right before I right before we could have checked to buy something, I'll reach yep. out to a company like that and go, "Hey, take a look at this and see what I missed." And I don't tell them there what I found. Go. I do not tell them what I found because that that yep. to me that breeds laziness, right? One thing that we get people to do is always start out small. Yeah. So we don't like to see people rush because we made this all these mistakes. We don't want people rushing out there and spending six figures on a website. If you, yeah. we say, in fact, your first website should be under two thousand dollars, because if you can't afford to lose two thousand dollars, you should not be doing this. Basically, <laughs> and you know, we're buying and selling businesses, right? So you can practice all these skills, not just website due diligence, but you know, SEO, content, renovating the website, fixing it up in a safe environment where you've bought this website under even under a thousand dollars, just buy a little starter site. It's not going, you're not buying it to, to um, make money off. You're buying it to learn the skills, which is going to then let you buy much bigger websites. So you understand what you're doing, because honestly, those small sites are exactly the same as doing due diligence on a bigger site. It's just, there's more zeros. That's it. It's the same stuff. It doesn't change across the board, whether it's a million dollar website or a $50,000 website or a $5,000 website, the due diligence is pretty much the same. We're, we're just looking at traffic, profit and the marketplace and what are the renovation opportunities. That's basically the skill you want to learn. So you can just teach yourself, start by buying a little tiny site under a thousand bucks. Easy. So yeah, we're definitely talk apples and oranges because what I was referring to is a two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollar purchase. Yes, right? v- yeah, v- yeah, bit of a different. And you, I've you, got need in- second, you need a second opinion. So, so in in our community, if you're in our community, we're happy to give an opinion though. We're like we're we're always happy to look over someone's due diligence. That's not a problem. But we, we can't sit there for two or three hours, and legally we're we're not allowed to. Right. But we we often help people all the time going through their own due diligence on a website. And I'll say, hey, what do you think of this site? What would you pay for it? We do that all the time. So yeah, that, that is the difference. You're spending six, whenever we've got clients spending six figures and above, we, we say, jump on a call with us. We're happy to have a chat. I would love to see a source for sites I can spend less than $2,000 to buy, double their yep. income, and they're on, because I, I used to be a domainer. You know what that phrase oh. is, right? Yeah, so domain's I, good. Yeah, I still, good I still own probably 125 domains. Yeah, um, but we we do a little bit of that. That's kind of a fun hobby thing for me. Yeah, so yeah. buying and selling uh, website domains, it's kind of like trading fine red wines. You know the trick to that, Ron. You got to sit on them for years. Yeah, and then someone approaches you and offers you lots of money for the for the. Uh, my biggest the, sell's been five grand or seven grand, I think, seventy five hundred. Yep. Like I had 3000 plus for a while there. I was paying yeah, go, yeah, a a lot VIP of the- account at GoDaddy, GoDaddy. I actually my own, had my own concierge there, right? Well, you yes, paid 30 grand a year in renewal fees. They, uh, they kind of tend to take care of you. So yep. I own, I own quite a few that are short brandable. Yeah. Uh, and you I- just, you just sit on them. You, you get, we, we, every so often we get an email for clients say, Hey Matt, someone just offered me 20 grand for this website. Should I take it? And I go, yes, you should. Cause it might've cost them, you know, 50 bucks. We've had, uh, one of our clients it was a classic. It was, um, I think it was Plastic Surgeon Texas or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it was something about plastic surgery in Texas. And they reached out to our client and said, we'll give you five grand for it. And the client asked me, what do you think? 
And I said, oh, that's worth way more than that. Just say, no, you're going to sit on it or, or send them an email back and say, look, I know it's worth more. If you want to buy it, you have to up the offer. Anyway, they got it for 25,000 US in the end. So that was pretty cool. And it only cost them like 50 bucks and they'd sat on it. But it, they admittedly, they'd sat on that for, you know, they had it in their portfolio for about five years. Yeah. But that's pretty cool. 25 grand just off two emails. It's not bad. That would be nice. Uh, so how do people reach out to you? How do they find you? What is your course called? So we run a course called the Digital Investors Program where we teach beginners how to buy and sell websites. But really the best thing you can do is watch our free masterclass because we go through this whole strategy and we show the exact kind of sites, these passion sites and what we pay for them and how we value them. So we've got a free masterclass on our website. If, you just, if you're listening to this, just go to ebusinessinstitute.com.au forward slash masterclass or just go to our website or you can Google my name, Matt Rad, and you'll find one of our two websites and there's always a link on there to the masterclass that's probably the easiest way awesome and that's so free it's about if, 90 minutes it goes through if, everything if let's wrap it up with this one if somebody could only remember one or two things from this show today what would you want the key takeaway to be learn if you like this sort of thing take the time to learn how to do proper website due diligence it's probably the key thing that'll keep you safe and it's the key thing that'll make you the most money over the next decade that's i agree my opinion yeah, but. I was in this. I was we did we talked about this before the show, but I was in this space once before and got burned and got out of it. And now just start, yep. thirty years or twenty years later, I'm returning to the space. And I think with the way the world is now, not, not just economically, but also the way business is moving online, and also you got to think there's so much, so many people want to be able to work from home or work remotely, like yourself, Ron. And there's a lot of burnout out there in society. So website assets are becoming more and more valuable, and they're viewed as online assets. So it's like money in the bank long term. So that's the other thing that I'd want you to take away from this. If you've never thought about buying and selling websites before, because you, you think they're just like pretty online brochures, they're not. They're actual online real estate. You get a good one. They are highly, highly valuable for the future. And therefore, it feeds back to learning how to do good website due diligence should uncover those gems, those diamonds in the rough. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you. And I think we'll call that a show. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft, Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT-enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now